Amen. Come on, can we put our hands together this morning? Amen. Amen. Hey, have a seat on your way down. Tell somebody, man, your hair looks so good this morning. Your hair, voluminous is the word that comes to mind. <laughs> Somebody, some of you were sitting next to a guy that didn't have hair. You're like, not applicable, not. <laughs> God of restoration, amen. But uh, man, it's so good to see you in church this morning. I'm excited you are here. You feeling good? Everybody have a pretty good week. It's gonna get better, we're in church. Man, great congregation this morning, so good to see everybody. If I haven't got a chance to meet you yet, my name's Andrew. Uh, my wife and I are so excited that you're here. We planted this church, honestly, this is like our seventh pre-launch service, and to see what God has done thus far has been nothing short of miraculous. So I wanna meet you. Don't rush off this morning. I wanna meet you, wanna get you plugged in. Hey, can we put our hands together for the worship team one time? Come on, they do good. They work so hard. Everybody who makes this possible, man, we have a team of guys here as early as 7.15 to turn this. We're crazy enough to have church in a CrossFit gym, and they turn this place into church, so so thankful for them, but uh, so glad you're here. Anybody enjoyed the Essential series so far? I can't believe it. We're already on week six of Essentials. Let's see if we can name the six weeks of Essentials. Let's see. Week one, man, that was a long time ago. We went forgiveness. Remember forgiveness? We had the jail cell. Week two, we went Holy Spirit. Man, it was so much fun. Week three, we went end times, right? We kind of impromptu end time. Week four, we went obedience. Last week was a lot of fun, wasn't it? We went evangelism. This week is going to be no different. I'm super excited for our sixth installment. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, we're going to be hanging out in the book of Job this morning. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, you can turn there. Not chapter one. We're actually going to start at the end in chapter 42. And I'm going to title the message and pray in a second, but it's going to take me a moment to get there. Um, most people always have this question for me. Like everybody who ever joins locals, like, Andrew, I just gotta ask you, like your ideas for sermons, where do you get them? And I gotta be real, about 95% of the sermons I preach, they come from my personal quiet time, right? I'll write some, that's why you should have a personal quiet time with the Lord. The best preacher in your life is not me, it's you, okay? Um, I'll, I'll write some stuff down, I'll take it to the team and be like, hey, do y'all think I should say this? And they're like, you should definitely say that. Andrew, don't say that, right? They'll say those things. Um, I'll take you to the team. But this was one of those ones that really struck a nerve, and they were like, man, you have to preach that in essential. Some guys in the church that I really trust that I took it to. But if you come from a church background like me, come on if you are a church kid through and through. Wave at me if you're a church kid. Come on, amen. Got counseling for all of us post-service, okay? So um, I'm a church kid through and through. I am a fifth-generation preacher. My grandparent, my grandparents' grand. what's basically what that, I'm fifth-generation Pentecostal charismatic preacher. What that that means is my family can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with your family in dysfunction, okay? So um, I'm so excited you're here, but we're hanging out in Job, but if you come from a church background, Job is like crazy, and what I love about local is we have so many different church backgrounds represented. Some of you are kind of like me, like I'm a little bit of a mutt spiritually. Uh, I was raised kind of born into the church of God and then charismatic, and then in college I attended a Baptist church that I absolutely loved, and then we sit here today non-denomination with so many different people groups, it's absolutely amazing. But Job is one of those books, it's just confusing. It's spiritually, I'll go out to say it's a little bit depressing. First time I read Job, uh, I was calling it Job. I was like, the book of Job. Some of you were like, I need one of those. That'd be a great book for me. It'd be a great book for our country, wouldn't it? So uh, it, it was just crazy. It was insane. I didn't understand it at all. And some of you are thinking, why in the world is Andrew preaching out of Job this morning? Like, we just came off of an amazing time last week on evangelism, found people, and he's going for the most depressing book ever. Does Andrew need a hug? Is he okay? I want to be, be gentle when I say this, but I want to be a little bit uh, harsh when I say this, too. You can write this down. Uh, most of the time, when Job is preached from, it's preached from incorrectly. It's preached from, I truly believe it, it's preached from wrongly. Because what most preachers will do, they'll get up here and they'll preach out of Job and they'll literally only preach the first two chapters. They'll stop at the end of chapter two. Y'all, we do understand there are 40 other chapters. When we come to church and we preach out of Job and we stop, I know all the terrible stuff happened to Job, but I read something in chapter 42, verse 12, and it absolutely knocked me out of my chair. If you come from a church background, you've never seen this before. Watch this. Watch this. I've never seen this before until recently. Watch this. This is after all the bad stuff happened, the most terrible, worst day ever for Job, okay? But then the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. Amen. Here's what I know. Everybody in this room, you want to be blessed. You want that. I read that, and I'm like, I want that. 
I want God's blessing on my life. I want God's blessing on this church. There's always a super Christian. Every church has them. And like, I don't know if I want the blessing. Shut up, okay? I'll take your blessing too, okay? I'm gonna get back in line for your blessing, okay? We need the blessing of God on our life. But I don't just want that for me. I want that for you. I want that for this church. I want God to do so much in our church. And I don't think we give God enough credit for what he wants to do in our life. Did you know God wants to bless you more than maybe you even think? God's already doing more in your life than you even imagine right now. So here's what we're going to do. This entire morning, I'm going to talk to you about how to live a life blessed by God. Amen. Some of you are like, I knew it. I knew this charismatic, crazy dude. I knew this was coming. I came in here with one foot on the brake. Now I got two foot on the brake, and I don't even like this guy. I actually hate this guy. And I'm not even sure I want to be here right now because in a moment, he's going to start selling prayer hankies, and he's going to be a big throne out here for him to sit on, and it's going to get super weird. Listen to me. I'm not doing any of that. Name it and claim it. I'm not that guy. Blab it and grab it. I'm not that guy. Today, I'm not going to, we're not selling nothing. As a matter of fact, I'm going to walk you through, maybe quite possibly, one of the most difficult, challenging sermons we've had in this series. So if you're taking notes, you can write it down. I've titled this talk, The Blessed Life. Week six, Essentials, The Blessed Life. Let's pray. Lord, do what only you can do. We love you. We thank you in your name. Amen. All right, we're in church. You got to be honest. Um, who here, just by show of hands, you have, it will start off with softball. Um, you have ever been mad, not angry. I'm talking mad, like ticked off. Raise your hand, right? All the parents. All the parents are up, right? And the single people. The single people are like, yeah, man. If your hand's not up, you're a liar, okay? You're a liar. We've all been mad before. We've all been ticked off before. This is where I really wanted to get, though. Who here, by show of hands, you've ever been so mad that, listen, you have hit something or someone? Raise your hand. Wow. A lot of violent people at local church, man. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've hit something or someone. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise it. Raise it. Raise it. What'd you hit, Mario? What'd you hit? <laughs> what was his name? No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. What, what'd you? So there, okay, there it is, there it is, there it is. Uh, every guy has had that point in their life. This is what guys do in their adolescent years for some reason. We, gotta get, we will hit a door or a wall. Come on, man, if you've hit a door in your wall, raise your hand, wave at me. Yeah, we are. We repent, Lord, it's us. I have, right? And then we feel like geniuses, right? The wall's never injured, just our hands injured, right? Like you've been there, I've been there before. It's so, so frustrating. Who here, you've ever been confused? Come on, all the single guys, for sure. All the dating guys, all the married guys, my Lord. All the men, dude, we're so confused. We are, like we really, we're just guys, huh? Like we're so confused, I'll never forget. We got married, and I came into the bedroom one, and uh, 78 pillows on the bed. <laughs> 78 pillows on the bed. I mean, it's the same. Well, I'm, so con I'm still confused about it to this day. Uh, what about frustration? You've ever been super frustrated? Come on, come on. Parents, you know about this. Children, you know why? Because children take the ability for you away to talk in complete sentences. They do. Hey, get over here. What you do? Hey, hey, over here. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You should be yelling at your kids, right? We've all been mad. We've all been confused, annoyed, angry, ticked, frustrated. Let me ask you one more question, but don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand on this one because some of you would be honest. Most of you would not be honest, okay? Don't raise your hand. How many of you have ever been mad, confused, frustrated, annoyed, angry with God? Don't raise your hand. We don't talk about that in church, right? Especially not in the Southeast because the church is the place where you come to be fake, where you come to just be like, I got it together, everything's good, I don't want to talk about it. Um, at local church, we get real talk here. We do real talk every single week. That's all you get here at local church is real talk. We don't go surface level, we go real talk. Because here's what I know, in a room this size, there are for sure some people represented in this place. You find yourself in a season of life where you are mad, confused, frustrated, all of the above with God, can I be honest with you? I'm a pastor, a preacher, people like, like, like a professional Christian. And there's been moments in my life where I've been mad at God. There's been moments in my ministry where I am ticked off at God. Really, God? Really? This is how this is going to be, right? Really? This is how this was going to turn out? And don't judge me because you've been there too. Really, God? 
Why am I not married? Ooh. Why am I not married, God? For the love, God, she's married. I mean, come on, right? Why am I not married? This is how this is going to be. I want to be, because here's what I've learned. In church, if we're not careful, sometimes this is a place where we are made to feel small. I just come in with my head down. Nobody can really know what's going on. I'm okay. Come on, Romans 8, 28. I'm just going to sit in the back with my head down. And nobody knows that you are dying spiritually. Nobody knows what's going on at home. Nobody knows what's going on with the bank account. Nobody, and I just have to say, local church, I don't believe that's the way God designed this place to be. I don't believe this is a place where we are meant to live in secret, meant to live in hiding. And here's what I know. Everybody who goes through these, maybe you're here and you're praying for your spouse, you're praying for your business, you're praying for, maybe you're considered joining local church, and you're like, what do I do? Do I go here? Do I go there? Here's what I know. When you are faced, when you are frustrated, mad, annoyed with God, all of us are tempted to give up. Every single one of us. I can remember being in college, and I can remember doing calculus homework and being so annoyed that I threw my textbook across the room. Lord forgave me, okay? I threw my textbook, and I'm like, this is insane. I just want to give up. Satan created two things. Ready? Math and cats, for sure, okay? <laughs> Clowns are a questionable third, okay? Right? I just want to give up when you get frustrated. I'll never forget. I, my, I, I had a friend. And his dad used to love to work on cars. Anybody, you had a dad that was just always under the hood of the car, just doing stuff, just listening for stuff, right? Just doing all that stuff. I don't do any of that stuff. Um, take it to the shop, right? But he had his friend, and his dad was always, we would just watch his dad work under the car, right? That's where I learned to cuss, watching his dad work under the hood of the car. <laughs> Me and my friend were like, did you hear what I said? That was crazy, right? So he's throwing stuff, throwing wrenches, hitting his head on the hood. I'm done with this. Fooey on this. I'm out of here. I'm not messing with this anymore. We are tempted to give up. Sermon in a sentence. You ready for it? In case you have to go, in case you zonk out, in case your kid sets local kids on fire and you got to go, okay? Listen to me. Sermon in a sentence. Write this down. Do not give up on the God that has never given up on you. Amen. Do, I, don't, I don't know what season of life you're in right now, but do not give up on the God that has never given up on you. And here's where I get pushback. Well, Drew... I feel like I'm in a season where God's kind of already given up on me. I would say the very fact that you're here in a church, in a CrossFit gym that doesn't launch in a two and a half months, would say our God has not given up on you. You're here to hear this talk, to hear this for a reason this morning. Do not give up on God that's never given up on you. Watch what Galatians says in chapter 6. Watch this. Galatians chapter 6, you got it for me? Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. Amen. Don't become weary, a.k.a. don't give up on the God that has never given up on you. I want to give you three thoughts this morning. Three thoughts this morning. It's going to be super simple teaching. I'm going to have some scripture throughout. And here's the truth. Some of you really need this sermon this morning. Like you really need it this morning. Like you need it bad. Others of you, you're in a pretty good place. You don't really need it this morning. But here's what I know. I heard a pastor say it like this one time. You're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or heading to a storm. So I would file this one away. Sound good? Here we go. Three simple thoughts about living a blessed life. Really simple stuff right here. You ready? Write down the first thought. Life is hard. Like you needed me to tell you that. Life is hard. Ain't it? You screaming life is hard is like a football, football player yelling, they're trying to tackle me. Yes, son, they are trying to tackle you, okay? Life is hard. I've learned this. Um, uh, tragedy never makes an appointment. Never. Never. I've never had this phone call, ever. The Lord calls me, hey, man, what's up? Hey, everything's good, Lord, how are you? Okay, um, Thursday, 4 o'clock, car accident. Uh, Thursday doesn't work for me. How's Tuesday? Tuesday? Tuesday. I've never had that conversation, ever. Broken leg, mm, broken leg, broken pinky. I got to preach Sunday. I can't. Tragedy does not make an appointment. And here's what I've learned. Tragedy sneaks up at the weirdest times, doesn't it? Right? Who here, just by show of hands, you're a parent and you've ever taken your children to a theme park? Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's like, Disney World is the happiest place on earth. The heck it isn't. <laughs> Some of you were like, yeah, I thought it was great. You were high, okay? You did not take children with you. It is something else, right? But the commercials don't paint it like that, do they? The commercials, oh my goodness. Main Street, USA. No crowds. 
and that Mickey Mouse is in the middle of Main Street, and there's that, that perfect family locked arms running slow motion towards Mickey, <laughs> right? They're embracing the castles, and the, it's amazing, right? What they don't tell you is it costs $100 a minute to hug that mouse. <laughs> uh, right? They, they'll tell you about the lines. They don't tell you about the smells. Come on, somebody. They don't tell you about the sweat. You see a lot of people at theme parks doing that, right? Sweat rolling down their back, right? Sweat all, all the way down their back to their, never mind. Okay, so like the sweat is rolling down, and you're just like, I can't do this. Like this is insane. Even Disney can't sell the perfect life. Even it can't fall into the myth. Now let me get you where I need you with Job, okay? This is normal language here at local church. You gotta go read this on your own. We're a Bible church. There's not enough time for me to do this, okay? So you gotta go read chapter one and two of Job. It will take all of seven or eight minutes. Dad, you can read it with your family tonight, okay? Here we go. But Job is considered to be a blameless, upright man. Some good adjectives. I'm not even sure I would use those adjectives to describe myself. Blameless and upright. He's a godly man. He loved his family. He loved the Lord. He loved his wife. They had 10 kids. Something was working, okay? He loved his wife. Everything was good. He loved the Lord. He, he loved his kids so much, his kids would go out and have these parties and these celebrations. The Job, the dad, would actually make sacrifices to the Lord just in case any of his children sinned the night before. I mean, this was a family man who loved God, who did all those things. The Bible says he was rich. In this time period, by the way, many scholars believe that Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Not Genesis, Job. Many scholars believe that in this day, if you were rich, you were considered to be blessed by God. Job was a church man. He was in the men's ministry, guaranteed. He loved the Lord. But one time, this happens in Job chapter 1, verse 8, Satan and the Lord are having a conversation. By the way, you can write this down. There's always more going on in your life behind the scenes than you think. Some of you, the fact that you are here right now, you can look back six months ago and say, yep, I saw where the Lord was ordaining that and doing that to get me here. There's always doing more. And they're having a conversation. Satan's been like, I've been roaming the earth, just looking for somebody. And, and this is crazy. The Lord says, have you considered my servant Job? You're looking for somebody to mess with? Have you considered Job? Look, I love the Lord a lot. I want the Lord to use my life. I want to have favor on my life, but I don't ever want the Lord to start bragging on me, <laughs> right? Because I saw what happened to Job. Have you considered my servant Andrew, right? I don't want that. I don't want that to happen to me. Wherever that line is, I want to be like right under it, like right, like I love the Lord, but not that right here, okay, right here, because I don't want that to happen to me. And Satan's like, well, yeah, I've considered him, but his life's so good because you've blessed him. And he's blessed, so he's got money, he's got a great family, he's got a good job, he's not stressed, his family attends church. Like, yeah, he's blessed, but if you took that blessing away, I bet you he'd curse you. Here's the scary part. Satan's kind of right. Anybody can come to local church on a Sunday morning and lift their hands and worship when everything's right. Anybody can join a small group when life is great. Anybody can join the worship team when they're feeling good. Anybody can have, a, can have great family dynamic when the family dynamic is good. But what happens when it's not? So he continues right here. He says, fine, fine. Do whatever you want to him, right? Watch this, Job chapter 1, verse 11. Watch this, watch this, 11 and 12. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has. This is the Lord telling Satan. And he'll surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, do what you want. He's in your power. Don't miss this. Satan had to ask the Lord for permission. Okay. Sometimes in church, we view Satan and the Lord like they're in this stalemate slugfest, and they're going back and forth, trading shots. Uh-uh. Our God has no rival. He has no equal. Anything that Satan is trying to do, listen to me, it has to go through God first. Okay? This is Bible. If you do that, then he'll for surely save you. So Job has the day from hell. Job, the Bible says his house collapses. All ten children die. His wife is mad at him. He loses all of his livestock, loses all of his wealth. Ten children die. I can't imagine that pain. My little four-year-old scraped her knee the other day. I could barely take it. She's like, am I okay? I'm fighting back tears. I'm like, I think so. I think you're going to be okay. Right? Like Job has the worst day ever. But watch Job's reaction right here. Job chapter 1, verse 20. Watch this. Watch this. At this, Job got up, tore his robe, 
shaved his head, had a Britney moment, shaved his head, <laughs> fell to the ground in worship and said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will depart, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. So he's still following God. You took it all, it's okay. And then Satan and God have another conversation. If I'm Job, I'm like, y'all got to quit talking. Y'all got to quit hanging out. Seriously, this is getting out of hand. They have another conversation, really similar to the first one. Have you considered my servant? Yeah, I thought about it, but Job's healthy. And if he wasn't healthy, then maybe I'd be able to come after him, right? So he said, fine, do whatever you want, just don't kill him. So sure enough, the next morning, Job wakes up, calls the doctor, and the doctor said, no more monkey, no, I'm kidding. So he calls the doctor, and the doctor's like, that was stupid. He calls the doctor, and the doctor's like, yeah, man, you got cancer. Joe's got every cancer ever imaginable. Things are going terrible. The Bible says he has some friends show up. Three friends come visit him at the house. And I don't know if you've ever been in such bad shape or one of your friends has been in such bad shape. When you go visit them at the hospital, you just stare at them. You just don't know what to say. His friends stared at him, the Bible says, for seven days. They showed up and just stared at him. That would make me feel terrible if I was Joe, by the way. They just, they just stare at him. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to say. Everything's going terrible. And watch this. This is crazy. His wife gets so angry, she says, why don't you just curse God and die? I read it the first time, and I'm like, Lord, you killed the dog and left the wife. You could have at least killed the wife and left the dog. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> My Lord. <laughs> this is just the way I read the Bible, okay? I read the Bible in a way of like, I can see Satan, you know, messing with Job. He's like, yeah, we're going to collapse the house. Check. We're going to kill the kids. Check. We're going to kill all his animals. No more wealth. Take all his money. Check. And the demons are sitting over there, and they're like, Satan, you do know his wife's still over there, right? And Satan looks back at the demons, and he starts laughing. He's like, I know. I'm going to leave her. Okay? So <laughs> this is crazy right here. This is a terrible... All the women are like, I will kill you. Okay? So this is terrible right here. He's having a terrible, terrible day. But we judge Mrs. Job. That's, we, we don't know her name. We'll call her Mrs. Job. We judge her. Everybody's like, can you believe his wife did that? Don't judge her, though. She just lost all 10 of her children, just watched her husband go bankrupt, watching her husband lose his mind, know that he's doing, dying a slow, painful death, and it's just a matter of time before she is going to be left on her own. Job was a man of God, but guess what? Life's hard. Life's hard. Life's tough, and it's always the shots you don't see coming. It's always the things you didn't anticipate happening. Life is Hard. Now, if you come from a church background, this is usually where the pastor ends. Job had a hard life, and nobody in here has a life like Job. So suck it up, read your Bible, get in the Word, let's pray and go home. Right? You've heard that sermon before? I've heard that sermon before, right? Um, I'm not here today to outpain your pain. You ever met somebody that does that, that always has to one-up your pain? If you're here and you've never met somebody that does that, you are that person that does that. <laughs> And you have no friends. <laughs> you don't have any Facebook friends, okay? But there's always those people. Like, for instance, tonight, you can get home. You can be cutting tomatoes with, I don't know if y'all, I don't know if Instagram ads get you guys, but I get Instagram ads for, like, knives all the time, right? You're cutting stuff, and it's one of those knives you, you order at the Instagram got you. You're home cutting tomatoes, but it's one of those knives where you can cut tomatoes in the kitchen. Then you can go out to the driveway and saw the bumper on your car. And then you, you know these knives I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Uh, and then you go back inside and you start cutting tomatoes, right? And you cut your finger, and it's bad. You're like, oh, snap, cut my finger. This is real bad. I got to go to the doctor. You get three stitches. They gauze you up real good. You come to work the next day, right? You come to work, and you're like, somebody's like, what's wrong with your finger? You're like, man, I cut myself. Last night I was cutting tomatoes, went in the driveway, got Instagram ads crazy, cut this bumper off my car, came back in, was cutting some more tomatoes, and I severed my finger. And they look at you, and they go, that's not pain. I'll show you real pain. You see that leg? That's not my real leg. <laughs> 20 years ago, I was in the Amazon, had a backpack full of Bibles, trying to reach unchurched people for the Lord. And I was storming through the woods, and a tree fell. And when the tree fell, it pinned my leg under the tree. And there was man-eating ants coming at me. And I'm sitting here with, i got to reach people for Jesus. And the Lord spoke to me in a vision. He, he appeared to me in my spirit. And I took out my pocket knife, and I cut my leg off. And then I took that pocket knife, and I carved the leg out of the tree, and I put it on there, and I reached those people for Jesus. That's how I got this leg. I don't want to hear about your finger. 
You've met, it's okay to slap that guy. Okay? <laughs> Don't hit people, but that guy. It's in the Bible. Second hesitations, after the maps. Right? I don't know your pain. I don't know your pain. I don't know what you're dealing with. I can't define your pain. But here's the truth. You don't need me to define your pain. If you're here, here's maybe some pain you're going through. Here's the first type of pain. Emotional pain. Emotional pain. Could you imagine the emotional pain? Ten children? Emotional pain. There's people in this room right now. You are dealing with emotional pain. I've talked to people all of my ministry. There is sexual abuse in your past represented in this room. There are miscarriages represented in this room. There is depression that nobody knows about represented in this room that you don't feel like you can talk to anybody about because you feel like it'll make you look weak when in reality it makes them weak because they can't hear the truth of what's going on in your life. But like I said, church is fake, so we don't talk about it. We die with emotional pain. Here's another one, financial pain. Maybe in 2021 you lost everything you had and nobody knows. Your wife knows, your husband knows, your family knows, and you've dealt with it. And every week you wonder, how in the world am I going to do this? Here's one, relational pain. Cut so deep. There's married people in the room, and I know in a room this size, there's people for sure here thinking you're married and you're thinking, what in the world did I get myself into? Why in the world am I doing this? Did I make a mistake? There's people in here, you have best friends that you haven't spoken to in years. And that pain's real. And that pain hurts bad. There's relational pain. Here's another one we don't talk about in church. Physical pain. We skip this one all the time. There are people of all ages in churches all over our city that go to the doctor and leave with a report they had no idea. What do you do with that? What do you do with it? That's physical pain. Here's the last one. Here's spiritual pain. Unfortunately, there was a rule of, uh, a way of thinking back in the Bible days that has made its way into today. That God does good things for good people and God does bad things for bad people. That's not true, by the way. And you sit here today, and you're like, why is all this bad stuff happening? Evidently, the Lord hates me. There's only two problems with that way of thinking, the Bible and Jesus. But in church, we've narrowed down our walk with Christ into these, I'm going to just say it how I feel at this local church. We narrow our walk with Christ down to these stupid little bumper stickers and stupid little phrases that are all over Savannah. Can I tell you something? Most of the coffee cups, quotes, and Christian bookstores all over our nation, how can I say this? They're dumb. They're not true. You want to hear one of my favorites that really grinds my gears? Ready for it? Here's one. <laughs> the safest place to be is right in the middle of the will of God. <laughs> um, what about Jesus, who wound up naked, nailed to a tree? Side note, in the middle of the will of God. <laughs> what about the disciples that followed him? They ended up being martyred for him. Only one that wasn't martyred was John, right? And they boiled him in oil. Just kill me, okay? I'll skip that part. Like, like what about them? The safest place to be is in the middle of the... It sounds so poetic. It sounds so beautiful. It sounds so right. But it's so wrong. Write this down if you're taking notes. God's will is good. God's will is right, but God's will is anything but safe. Yeah. It's good, it's right, but please believe me, it's anything but safe. Job was annoyed, he was sad, he was angry, he was confused, he was a man of God. Life is hard. Um, I don't know if you do this. I, I'll admit something here. I, I am obsessed with watching TV preachers. Oh, you're judging me, okay? TV preachers. Um, it drives Naomi crazy. And not all TV preachers are bad, just like 99% of them, okay? But, like, I, I, just, I just watch it. I, get it. I love all preaching, good preaching. But I just love the art of preaching, right? And uh, it drives me nuts. You want to know the preachers that really drive me nuts? The health and wealth guys. You know what I'm talking about? Give this dollar amount and the Lord's going to bless you, right? I'll send you a prayer cloth. I'll, statement of faith. You ever seen that before? Give unto God. You're going to get perfect health, and you're going to get this, and you're going to get that. It's just not true, church. What do you do with Jesus? Here's what I'll tell you. Life is hard. Jesus said it like this in John chapter 16, verse 33. Watch this. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you might have some trouble. Nope. 
There's a possibility you're going to have some trouble. Mm -mm. You will have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world. Number one, life is hard. Write down number two. Life is hard. Number two, God is still God. God is still God. I'm going to push down on this right here. You can write this down if you're taking notes. Write this down. My circumstances do not alter God's character. We're good on that, right? I know it's not sexy, but it's true. My circumstances do not alter God's character. We have to make a decision. Is the decision going to be that I'm going to let my circumstances dictate my view of God? Or am I going to let my God dictate my view of my circumstances? Here's what I've noticed. People who live a joy-filled life, they view their life through a God filter. People who live a sad, miserable life, they view their life through a circumstance filter. How are you going to view it? I heard a story one time about two dudes on a plane. It was two guys on a plane. They were flying to Israel. One of them was a redneck from South Carolina. Yee, yee, right? Like he was just one of the boys. We'll say Rinkin, okay? Make it more applicable. From Rinkin. And I uh, had to bring in the rednecks, okay, so um, from Rinkin. And um, he was on the plane, and it was his first time ever flying Business International. And they say, I've never flown Business International, but they say it's insane, right? They bring you a bag that has a hot towel. What? Only hot towel I've ever gotten is out the dryer. You know what I'm saying? It just sits in the chair for like three years till you fold it, right? So, and they bring you a bag, and it's got like an eye mask in it. It's got, uh, it's got booties for your feet, right? I had to clarify. Anytime you say the word booty at local church, some of you weren't paying attention. You're like, what? Okay, so I um, had to bring y'all in, okay? So he's got all this stuff. They're in a bed, right? This is insane. They're serving them steak, right? But then there's this other dude who gets a steak, right? And he's mad about the way the steak is cooked, right? Homeboy, you are in the air in a bed eating steak, like, like chair in the air, right, in a plane, eating steak. Is this how you view your life? Are you going to view your life like the redneck from Rinkin? Are you going to view your life like the dude from Texas? The guy was from Texas, by the way, right? The, the, the flight attendant came over. Side note, this has nothing to do with the sermon. Came over and was like, hey, how's your steak? And he's like, it ain't good. In Texas, we eat them rare. Anybody from Texas, wave at me. Wave at me if you're from Texas. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll pray for you guys, right? I just feel the need to remind people that are from Texas, our country would survive without you, okay? Everybody you meet that's from Texas is like, I'm from Texas. And I'm like, I love Texas, I know, but we're all from America. I'm teasing, okay? So here we go. Let's keep going. Here's something you've never heard a charismatic preacher say. You can write this down. Emotion will not sustain your devotion. It won't. I don't care how many moments you have in the altar. I don't care. It will not sustain your devotion. You have to make the decision before the decision. Yeah. Any Georgia Bulldog fans in the house? Yeah, don't bark. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> y'all remember a few years back when they hired Kirby Smart? He's the football coach. Anybody who doesn't know, just look at me and shake your head, okay? They hired Kirby Smart. You remember all the Georgia fans? <laughs> he ain't proven nothing. Kirby Smart? Where's Mark Rick? He ain't proven nothing. Right now, the last three years in this state, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and Kirby, okay? Right? I'm not a Georgia fan, so for me, he's Darth Visor, okay? I don't, I don't like Kirby, okay? So, but this is insane, right? Emotion will not sustain your devotion. You have to choose now. Now, I was reading through the Catalyst verses in this in chapter 19, and I've always heard this preach. I've got to preach fast. Listen fast. I've always heard this preach. Job was a righteous man. And Job was a righteous man because he never questioned God. No, no, sir. You stopped reading in chapter 2. Because watch this. Job actually goes as far to say, he gets so ticked, he goes, if God would come down here, we could settle this. He gets his opportunity. Chapter 38, the Lord speaks out to Job. Write this down. And he says, Job, brace yourself like a man. I like the way the King James says it. He says, Job, gird your loins. <laughs> That'd be a good local shirt, right? <laughs> Our next t-shirt drop, gird your loins, right? <laughs> oh, stupid. <laughs> All right, he's like, brace yourself like a man. Job doubted. Job was angry. Job was confused. Job was annoyed. Fun fact, Jesus said that John the Baptist was the greatest man to ever live. 
right after John the Baptist question if he was the one. John the Baptist said, go check with Jesus. He's still the one or should I look for another? Yeah, that's the greatest man to ever live. Wait a minute, Jesus, he just questioned you. I know, that's the greatest man to ever live. Job questioned, he was angry, and what we've been taught is people of faith, people in church, don't question God. Yeah. Romans 28, 820, just put your head down, right? All things can be definitely good. Don't worry about it. Don't stress. It's going to be okay. It's insane to me, but here's the truth. People that God most often uses are usually the people that have the biggest questions, the biggest confusions, the biggest holdups, the biggest hiccups, the biggest problems. But watch Job right here. He has this faith. I'm not even sure I have this kind of faith. Watch Job 19, verse 25. Throw it up there for me, Joey. Job 19, verse 25. He says, all this bad stuff's happened. He's sick. His wife don't even like him anymore. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on earth. After my skin has been destroyed, yet my flesh, I will see God. Wait, Job, you lost your children, you lost your money, your life's in shambles. Write this down if you're taking notes. Just because God feels inactive doesn't mean God's absent. Some of you right now, you're like, I don't see God. What if I told you this morning that God was in the background adjusting your foreground? We don't put faith in things that other people put faith in. Our God is still God, and our God is still good. 2,000 years ago, he emptied a tomb, and the tomb's still empty. Our faith is in not the other things. It's in God. Now, I want to share a verse with you that church people love to misquote. Tied for first, at least. The other ones, the money is the root of all evil. That's not what it says. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Watch this. This is a verse we love to misquote. I'm going to read it to you. Romans 8, 28. Throw it up there. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things... God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I call this the funeral verse. Uh, this is the verse everybody tells everybody when something bad happens, right, or something sad happens. Hey, God works all things together for the good. Hey, God works all things together for the good. Hey, God, if, um, have you ever been that? You're like, if you say that one more time, I'm going to break out another verse, the one where Jesus pulled out the whip and cleared the temple. Okay, don't say it again. <laughs> God works all things together for the good. That's what it says, right? God works all things together for the good? Maybe. Let's read it again. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Amen. Not for everybody. Right. Some of you are like, that is, that is terrifying. I hope that shakes us to our core. Amen. We love to misquote that scripture. Like if it comes down to my kid getting blessed and your kid getting blessed, my kid wins every time. And don't judge me because parents, it's the same for you. I've been at theme parks. My kid wants to see Tinkerbell. I'm going to see Tinkerbell. I don't care if I cut in line. I'll, I'll buck at another adult. Like, I, my kid's going to see Tinkerbell. If I want to do that for my daughters, how much more do you think our Heavenly Father wants to do for us? For those who love Him. Let's keep going right here. And some of you sit here and you're like, well, Andrew, I'm a Christian and my life's not good. I'm a Christian and you're telling me I love the Lord and all things haven't worked together for the good yet. What's going on? Write this down. Well, if it ain't good, God ain't done. Amen. Because when it's done, it'll be good. Let me just encourage somebody because we judge Job because we read Job chapter 2 with chapter 42 in mind. We read Job and we see him get mad and tell God to come down here. and they, we, re, we judge him because we know how the story ends. Let me just put it plain for you this morning. Some of you are in your Job story, but you're in the middle of chapter 2. But you don't know chapter 42 is still being written. This is not your end. If God did it for Job, he can do it for you. Some of you sit here and you're like, I don't know how God you could use my story. My story is jacked up, bro. And you could tell me your story. And I'd be like, yeah, your story's jacked up, bro. I don't know how God's gonna use that. But here's what I know. Our God turned a bloodstained cross into an empty tomb. He can use your story. He'll use it. He'll spin it. He'll use it for his good. And also, don't try to lecture God on what to do with your life from this point on. Well, God, this would be a good idea if you could do this. Or come on, if you could bring that man, he's handsome. What? Don't try to tell God what to do. Just by show of hands. Who here, bring this thing for clothes, you have ever seen any of the Star Wars movies? Wave at me. Don't judge me. I've never seen any of them, okay? Some of you are like, I'm going to leave the church. Leave. Um, like nerds anyway. No, I'm kidding, okay? So um, I've never seen any of the Star Wars movies. I've never seen any of them, but I heard they're great, right? I heard they're amazing. I heard they're awesome. Um, they were directed and written by a man named George Lucas, 
Who here, you've never seen any of them? You're with me. You're with me. Yeah, yeah, If we got all of us together, all the cool people, all of us together, <laughs> and we went into this room over here, and I said, hey, guys, we're going to go watch 10 seconds. There's six of them, I believe. Maybe there's more now. I don't know. There's, there's how many? Wow. Okay, so um, <laughs> that's nine too many. Um, so, and we went to this room, and we watched 10 seconds of one of the nine. And then we came out here, and I had my buddy George Lucas here, the guy who wrote them. And he was standing right here, sitting right there on that box. And uh, we all came out as a posse. None of us had ever seen it. And we said, hey, uh, Mr. Lucas, um, we watched your series. It was pretty good. But uh, let me tell you a few things that I would change. None of us would do that. We just saw 10 seconds of a nine-part movie series. The same thing goes with God. Listen to me. You're telling God what to do with your life. God's already got your life already written out. But listen to me. You are in the middle of chapter 2. And I just want to encourage you, chapter 42 is coming. Life is hard. God is still God. And God is still good. Write down my last thought. If you want to be blessed, understand life's hard. Got to know God's still God. It's my last thought. You got to keep going. You got to keep going. You got to keep going. There's, parents, you'll get this. There is nothing more sad than watching your child give up on something you know they could do, right? It's frustrating. Being a parent in general is frustrating, isn't it? Isn't it crazy the thing that frustrates you about your kid is the same thing that frustrated your parents about you? Right? Other night, me and Paisley were watching UFC, and um, it's a Christian show if you haven't seen it, and we're watching it. And, uh, and my fighter lost. And I said, crap. Paisley said, Dad, don't say that. I said, sorry, sorry. Other day, we're on the way to school. I got to get her to Calvary before the late bell. I'm driving fast. She goes, Daddy, are we speeding? I said, okay, Holy Spirit, stop, okay? But it's, it's frustrating being a parent. But nothing's more frustrating than watching your kid give up on something you know they could do. A gymnastics move, sight words, uh, whatever it is, a baseball, whatever. There's nothing more frustrating than watching them give up. How do you think our Heavenly Father feels about us? He knows what we're capable of. He knows what your story from this point on could be, but you can't give up. But God, I'm frustrated. I know, but you're in chapter two. But God, I'm annoyed. I know, but I had to get your heart broken right there so you could meet that person. But God, I don't want to do it. I know, but God is still good. He's still writing your story. I'll end with this verse right here. Watch what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, a couple verses. Therefore, we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, though outwardly me and my spouse are having problems, though outwardly financial situations don't look great, though outwardly I hate my job, though outwardly I don't, under, I don't know if it's going to work out, though outwardly I can't get over this addiction, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Verse 17, for our light and momentary troubles. Whatever you're going through, the writer right here, Paul in Corinthians, he says whatever you're going through is light and momentary. I don't know what you're going through, but I know what this guy who wrote this was going through. Just in a little bit, he loses his head and he dies for Jesus. And he calls his problems light and momentary. Can we stand to our feet all across this place? Heads bowed, eyes closed, just a moment between you and the Lord. Nobody looking around. It's that verse, man, Job 42, verse 12. And the Lord blessed the second half of Job's life even more than the first. I want that. I want that for you. It's essential. You want to live a blessed life? It's really simple. Life's hard. God is still God. God is still good you got to keep going. Heads bowed, eyes closed all across this place. Nobody looking around. Not going to give up on the God that's never given up on me. My God's got my back. He's still writing my story. Truth is, there's tragedy in this room. There's pain in this room. There's sorrow in this room. There's tough time. And you came in this morning not having an answer. This has nothing to do with information. It has everything to do with transformation. If you came in here and you're like, Holy Spirit, you spoke to me this morning. Would you just shoot your hand up? Shoot it up. Hands up all over the place. You spoke to me this morning. You spoke to me this morning. You spoke to me this morning. Everybody whose hand's not up, why don't you join everybody whose hands are up? They're all over the place. Let's pray, and we're going to sing one more song. 
Lord Jesus, we love you. God, thank you for what you're doing in our lives, God. We want to live a blessed life. Lord, you bless, if you did it for Job, you can do it for me. I'm in a situation in my life. I didn't plan on being here. I didn't want to be here. This is how, not how I would have written my story. But Lord, right now, I believe that you can do more with the second half of my life from this point forward than you ever did in the first half. Lord, bless my marriage. Lord, bless my relationships. Lord, bless my finances. Bless my church. Bless this church. But right now, we declare life's hard. God's still God. And keep going. Let's worship.